Cool. Thanks. Okay. Um, so I am using somebody else's laptop and don't have like a preview of the next slide or anything. So let's hope this goes well. Um, yeah. Thanks for coming to talk about testing. Um, just a brief inter introduction. I'm a site reliability engineer or SRE at Pregult.org. I'm also a tech ambassador, which means I spend a small amount of my time also writing blogs and making talks like this one. Um, I developed a lot of the continuous integration processes um, in my organization for building Docker images. Um, and yeah, this is my third PyCon um, and my second talk uh, with Python and Docker stuff. Um, yeah, uh, last, last year's talk um, has a bunch of similar stuff in the introduction, which I'll get to. Um, we're breakout.org. Um, we build, uh, we're a nonprofit, and we build mostly mobile applications around um, healthcare, um, uh, particularly messaging based things, so SMS, USSD, WhatsApp, um, but also some mobile sites. Um, yeah, uh, so if you were in the talk next in the room just over there, um, you've also had a fun introduction to Docker and containers. Um, so I'm going to try to go through this quickly. This is also, these slides are like from last year's talk as well. So um, basically what's a Linux container? Um, it's an isolated uh, process and the process has a certain view of its operating system. Um, so it can only see certain other processes, certain other users, certain networks, etc. Um, it's also limited by um, a tool in the Linux kernel called cgroups. So you can limit how much CPU memory, um, things like that, your container has. Um, and this is kind of similar to VM, but um, in implementation quite different. Uh, Docker containers, Docker is the most popular container technology. Containers are not really a new idea, but uh, Docker is kind of the first, the first time it's really caught on, I think. Um, and Docker has worked well because it includes a lot of stuff just out of the box. It's very easy to use and has lots of sensible defaults. Before, you had to kind of know a whole bunch of stuff about the Linux kernel to be able to make Linux containers, but now you don't really. Um, it also has a layered file system, um, which means that containers can share a lot of data between each other. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about that. Uh, also, images are available for lots and lots of software that you might use. Um, so it's kind of cool. You can just, you have this command line tool, and you can Docker run all kinds of things that you might need to. Um, yeah. So why would you want to use containers? Um, big thing is that they give you like this consistent portability for your software. So you package your software in a container image, and that will then include basically everything it needs to run with it. Um, and it also provides a way to actually run your program. So when you start the container, it has some predefined way to run. Um, as I said before, limit access to resources. And as was pointed out in the talk in the other room, it kind of eliminates this idea of like it works on my machine. A container should run the same pretty much everywhere. All right. Also, <laughs> in the other talk, there was a similar diagram with three boxes and two arrows between them. Um, but it's important to get this terminology right. So generally, you start with the Docker file. It's a file on disk. It's a set of instructions for how to build your, your image. Um, I will talk more about that soon. Uh, you run this Docker build command. You get an image. And those are the layers on disk of your image. That's everything is kind of compiled into the image. And then when you run the image using the docker run command, you get a container, which is just a running process, but in this isolated environment. All right, uh, and the terms image and container are kind of conflated quite often. I'm going to try and be accurate. Um, yeah, another concept I need to explain for this is the docker daemon. Um, so when you run a docker command on your system, it's a, you're using this command line tool that actually makes uh, API requests to the Docker daemon. Um, and the daemon kind of like this all-powerful thing that runs all the time and manages all the containers that are running. Um, this has actually been kind of a criticism of Docker, that the Docker daemon is just 
does too much things at once, um, kind of violates the Unix principle. But for uh, our purposes, it's quite useful because it has this API. And if you need to interact with containers, you just speak the API. Um, OK, so to define the problem. Um, so to start out, here's an example Docker file. Um, like I said, there's a set of instructions. Um, all Docker files start with a from instruction, which is the image that you start building on top of. Um, so all Docker images are built on top of other ones. Um, and each command, kind of starting with the purple word, um, it will build another layer onto the image. Um, so in this case, we're doing some, this is all kind of made up, but we're adding a non-root user that we're going to run our program as, uh, installing some packages we need from apt. Uh, then we're setting up a directory to put our source code in. Uh, we copy in the requirements, install the requirements, fairly boring stuff, install the source. Uh, we maybe set some environment variables. Um, and finally, we usually put in like an entry point script. So this is what I talked about, where there's a defined way um, that the process will run when you start the container. So you tell it, this is what you run when I start you up. Um, yeah, so moving on to the entry point script. Um, it's usually just some kind of bash script or shell script. Um, hopefully it's quite simple, but sometimes you need to do some more complex things. Um, so this one in particular like sets the right permissions for a volume that was maybe mounted at a certain place. Um, if you don't give it any arguments, it by default runs G-Unicorn. This is a pretend like Django app or something. Um, it also does some things like switches to the non-root user. Um, and finally, it just executes the final command it's come up with. Um, yeah. Uh, then you're also probably going to have some config in your application that is kind of, kind of Docker specific. So a quite common pattern is this, uh, what they call like the 12-factor app pattern, um, which <laughs> means several things, but I think the thing that a lot of people take away is that you just s configure lots of stuff with environment variables. Um, but that's something you probably don't do that much outside of Docker. Um, yeah, and kind of my point here is that we've got like quite a lot of code here that is largely going untested. Docker files and entry point scripts and config is code. Um, so how is this usually solved? Um, I've seen quite a lot of bash scripts out there. Um, so this is a script, just you're not supposed to be able to read this, um, but it's from the Docker official images and this is one of the scripts that runs the tests. Um, this is 228 lines and that just uh, runs a set of other scripts that are in a certain file structure in certain directories and I mean it's okay it it works um, and I think it is very lucky that the docker people have somebody who's really good at bash scripts who can manage all of this um, yeah uh, there's some kind of improvements in this so one thing I've seen is this there's this project called bats or bash automated test scripting so these are the tests for if you ever used Alpine Linux docker image these are literally copy pasted from the repo um, and you can see it it is still bash it's still a shell script but it's just uh, more nicely structured and you can st start to see kind of the kind of tests one might want to run against a docker image so like run some command check the status code is zero good happy um, check the I don't know the time zone in the image is correct um, Another thing that people often do is that they have like a Docker Compose file for their project. Um, so that might, uh, say in this example, starts up, say the project is um, you know, a Python server, I think that's Django again. Um, and it runs that, but it has like this dependency on a database. You also start up like a database and some other things. And that's great, and Docker Compose is written in Python, so yay, and it's a really useful tool, but this doesn't assert anything. So you probably still have some kind of script that would be actually checking that things are expected. Docker Compose won't do that for you. Um, yeah, so just a note here, um, this is from Google's uh, official shell style guide. Um, 
and it has the section on when to use shell. And it's like, if you are writing a script that is more than 100 lines long, you should probably be writing it in Python instead. Um, great. <laughs> Uh, okay, so I'm going to sort of propose a solution. It's not the only one. Um, and it's a library we wrote called Seaworthy. Um, the idea is containers on a ship, and so you have to judge them for seaworthiness. Uh, yeah. So, like I said, library written in Python. Um, it integrates with Docker uh, via the Docker daemon API that I talked about using the Docker, the official Docker API client. Um, so it allows you to interact with the Docker daemon programmatically, which is quite rare out of the other things. Most of them um, interact using the command line interface or s something like Docker Compose. You write a YAML file, but it doesn't have any API for programmatically interacting with Docker itself. Um, yeah, so the way this works is you write uh, these various Docker resources and so things like containers, images, volumes as uh, as like these definitions um, and use them in tests as fixtures. Uh, and see where they will handle things like creation and teardown of resources for you. Uh, and it also includes some common containers that you might need to run your application. Like in the previous example, there's a database so we've written a kind of a Postgres uh, container for you to use. Um, it also has some tools to make sure that your containers have actually fully started, which is another kind of pain point with Docker Compose, I think. Um, Docker Compose has this idea of like, uh, you can make one, one service depend on another, but all that does is check that the container is in a running state, not that your container is uh, actually started. Um, and Really, the idea with Seaworthy was that we like writing tests in Python already. We know how to do it. We use tools like PyTest. And so the idea is we carry on using those just with Docker stuff. Um, yeah, so I mentioned resource definitions. Um, so we had to kind of make this way to define um, a container or image or volume before it actually exists in Docker or it has been started. Um, so that we know how to create it for each test and then how to tear it down. Um, so there's container definition, volume definition, each of these different kinds. Um, yeah, this also provides some uh, kind of niceties around the Docker API. Um, when you run a command like docker run on the command line, it's doing a lot of calls to the API. So it's doing like check if there's an image, if it's not, pull the image create the container, start the container finally. So we kind of had to implement some of that um, kind of thing to make it just easier to get started. Um, yeah, and when we were designing it, the general idea was to try and keep the API similar to the Docker CLI and to Docker Compose. Um, so here's some examples of some resource definitions. Um, on the left, uh, kind of simpler things. Uh, like volumes and networks, you generally don't have to define or change a lot of things, and they don't generally have um, dependencies on other things. So if you just want a local directory that's going to be in your container, then you just say volume definition static. Um, all the stuff can be accessed under the hood, um, so you can make that, you can set all those options that you can also do with the Docker command line interface. If you set all the right options, it's all there. Um, but yeah, on the right, slightly more complicated. Um, so often with containers, you will override this container definition class um, and you'll kind of adjust some more things. Um, yeah, uh, so we're doing things like we're passing in the database URL, which we know is going to need to be an environment variable when the thing runs. Um, it will change from application to application. Uh, then there's also this idea of helpers inside Seaworthy. Um, so the Docker SDK is like quite a typical API client design and has this idea of models, which is um, you know like different resources, container, volume, and then like a collection. So you can list all the models in the collection, that kind of thing. Um, and so the definitions wrap models, but the helpers wrap collections of them. Um, 
and the helpers try to track everything that you create. So when you run your tests, you don't really want to have like a whole bunch of volumes and networks and containers hanging around afterwards. You want your machine to be clean so that you can run the tests again without any conflicts. Um, so it tries to track all those things. Um, yeah, uh, and which I will get to, we've written some integrations with PyTest so that um, you don't really have to worry about this concept of help as much if you're using PyTest. Um, yeah, like I mentioned, we're trying to do some sensible defaults to make it just easier to get running. Um, so it'll do things like pool images when you start up a container. Um, it'll also, like Docker Compose, create like a dedicated network for your different containers in the test. Um, and it will make those containers available by name, um, which is another thing that, uh, yeah, that Docker Compose does. Um, yeah, it also just supports like shorter forms of image names and volumes and stuff that are very similar to Docker Compose. Um, yeah, so something I mentioned is that an important thing is to know when your container is actually ready to be tested, like it has fully started. And one of the most kind of foolproof ways we found to do this is just to wait for a certain log line to appear. Um, so there's various tools to do this. And basically you define like a set of patterns that see where they should expect. And once it sees those, it knows, okay, this container is started, the fixture is ready, we can use it for testing. Um, there are some other strategies you could use. You could wait for the container to accept HTTP requests or like pass a health check. Um, or a very simple one would just be wait for it to be in the running state according to Docker. Uh, then there's some nice things like uh, we built in this HTTP client. So if you have a container that forwards, um, forwards some port to the host, um, you can just call HTTP client on it and you get this requests uh, client that is just automatically hooked up to the first forwarded port. You can adjust that and then you can just make requests against and you don't have to worry about what the address of your container is. Um, and here you can see a kind of test where you can just assert that this container actually returns the admin site uh, for Django. Uh, yeah, so I just wanted to have a kind of example of writing a test. These are oftentimes a little bit complicated, especially without the PyTest stuff, which I haven't got to yet. Um, but essentially, in the setup, uh, you would create your container. Here I'm just using one of the built-in ones that we have, uh, Postgres, um, and run these setup methods, and it starts up the container, make sure it's running, um, and then you add these cleanups. So you tear down after the test. Um, so you can see this is really just using a container like any other fixture. Um, yeah, and so we're just asserting like, we list the tables and all that's really doing is like calling docker exec and running psql inside the container and getting the output, making sure the return code is okay. But yeah, uh, generally the kind of tests you do, you'd run some command in the container, docker exec, like I mentioned, and you get the return code, the output, make sure it's okay. Uh, you could check like what logs standard out, standard error coming out of the container, make some HTTP requests, process trees, which I'll talk about in a bit. Um, and you can also just, like if you ever run like docker inspect on a container or an image or something, you can do stuff like that quite easily with Seaworthy. Um, so I do need to talk about some competitors. Um, test containers is probably the project that's most similar to this. In fact, yeah, um, we it is kind of inspired by test containers. We copied some of the functionality, but that is written in Java. If you're in Java land, great, and I would actually recommend that. It's quite full featured. Um, and Google's container structure tests. Um, this is more of a declarative style of testing. So you write a YAML file with all the things that you expect. Um, and as far as I know, it doesn't provide any way to um, like start up multiple uh, containers and volumes and set them up in a certain order or a certain way. Um, it's basically just you run one container. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, I'll try going through this fast. It's taking longer than I expected. PyTest. Um, PyTest does lots of things, as you probably know, but we're mostly interested in the fixtures. Um, so all of those definitions, um, 
I'm also just not going to explain <laughs> fixtures. You can, uh, I mean, most people should be familiar with PyTest fixtures. Um, uh, yeah, I'm going to skip ahead. Uh, the various definitions have uh, this PyTest fixture method on them, so you can just create a PyTest fixture from that, um, and then it's basically just available in your test. Um, there's also like an annotation you can add called Docker test, and then if Docker is not on the machine, it won't run those tests, uh, which is quite nice. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, another thing was test tools. Um, this is another t Python testing library. Uh, also does lots of things, but we're mostly interested in the matches. Well, the matches are useful for asserting on like more complex data types. So in this case, uh, we define a matcher for uh, responses from, say, a request when you're making a, a request. So this matcher checks the status code is 200, and the headers contains um, application JSON. And then we can reuse that matcher in different tests. Um, yeah, so the one place we use that is for process trees. So in this case, uh, we built this functionality where you can list the processes on a container, and then you can build a tree out of the processes. Um, and then you can assert that that tree looks a certain way. So here we've got um, the first argument here is like the user that it's running at. So if you remember way back, I had the example of a non-root user called Django. Um, the process runs with these arguments. Uh, the first process has PID 1, and then it has these children. Uh, yeah, so there were some difficulties. Um, the main thing is like getting these tests run fast enough because container stuff can be quite slow, like starting up a whole container. And the thing is, slow tests don't really get run, and that's bad. Uh, so resetting state can take quite a while. Um, like if you're restarting a Postgres database for every single test you do, things will be quite slow. Um, but ultimately, I want to say that Python is not really the bottleneck in this case. It's mostly waiting for things to happen in Dockerland. Um, and we found generally it's quite difficult to parallelize these things because Docker daemon on a single machine is not that great at parallelizing stuff. There's all kinds of locks inside of it that prevent you from doing more than one thing at once. Um, so some workarounds we did. So you can. Uh, kind of change the scope of your fixtures. You might want to make your database container actually last through all your tests and not be reset. Um, so uh, yeah, you kind of have to design your tests quite carefully. Um, there's also this idea of like a cleanable container that we made. Um, so you could just drop the databases, um, sorry, drop the tables in the database at the end of the test rather than like actually starting the whole container over. Um, yeah, so here's a test, and we have this Postgres container that has a much longer scope than just a single test. Um, and then you can add an annotation to clean the database if you need it to be clean before the test. Um, yeah, so another challenge is that like you don't really know what's inside the container. So if we're listing the processes and we use PS, maybe that isn't available there. Um, and uh, you know, like some containers might not even have basic Unix tools, and then how do you get to the files and do things in there? Uh, also, another challenge is like you have to quite carefully order how things are. So a container maybe needs the volumes it's going to use uh, to be created before you start the container. Uh, so you have to kind of define all this ordering. And PyTest does let us do that to a certain extent, because in PyTest, one fixture can consume another one. So PyTest will figure out the ordering for you. Um, yeah, so do and Docker Compose can do this more nicely because everything's declarative. You've defined everything in your YAML file before you even start. Um, yeah. OK, uh, I'll try and go very fast. OK, um, five minutes. OK, cool. Um, yeah, so future work. Um, so like I said, maintaining the state of containers is, is tricky. Um, so uh, other than other ideas, other than just like cleaning the, the state, um, we've had some like uh, you could do less on startup. So some database images I've seen like actually have like defined users and tables in the in the d image. So when your database starts up, it's in the state already, and you don't need to prepare anything. Um, 
there's an example of an image that does that. Uh, there's also some other Docker features we could use. So there's commit, which is kind of like just saving the file system of the container in a certain state. Um, then there's also Docker checkpoint, which sounds really cool, but it's still in experimental, so you can like completely save the state of a process, which could be quite cool, because then you just start your container at once, save it, and then kind of resume it for each test. Uh, also, multi-container patterns are kind of an unanswered thing at this point. Um, so there are various patterns that you may be familiar with, especially if you use Kubernetes. Um, and I think there's potential here for Seaworthy to test the integration between multiple containers in these cases. Um, yeah, it's kind of a like unexplored area. Uh, and then like Kubernetes overall, like should we be speaking to the Docker daemon? Should we rather just be interacting with Kubernetes and like just asking Kubernetes to run these containers and certain things from there? I don't know. Um, Kubernetes has become kind of a de facto standard, um, so potentially. Um, and uh, there's like potential for parallelizing the tests then because your containers could run all over a cluster um, and they would run independently. Uh, but it would also be quite sensitive to like how fast you can schedule containers onto the cluster. Um, has somebody come up with this already? I'm not even sure. Kubernetes moves so fast. Um, conclusions. Um, is this recreating production? I want to be clear that that's not what we're trying to do. Um, I think quite a common idea with Docker is that like, hey, this is great, I can run production on my laptop, I can just start up the database and everything. And um, I feel like in the DevOps space, we've kind of moved a little bit past that idea because you, you just can't simulate everything that's in production on your laptop, there's going to be something different. And the only real production environment is production itself. Um, so for that reason, we kind of tried to focus on just testing Docker files, entry point scripts, and basic config, those blocks of code I showed you near the beginning. Um, you could do more full-featured integration tests uh, for your application. Um, maybe that will work for some people, but we haven't really done that too much yet. Uh, and yeah, overall, this is quite a difficult problem. There's, there's, there's a lot to do, like writing a library like this is quite reasonably sized. Um, and Seaworthy kind of works well for the things we've used it for. And we'd really like more people to use it for more things um, and contribute. Uh, and yeah, the Docker container space kind of moves very, very quickly. And like keeping up with all the APIs and then Docker SDKs and all the different versions can be quite challenging sometimes. Um, but I think overall it's been like a really great learning experience. Um, we've found kind of interesting quirks in the way popular software behaves. Um, and from all those areas that I said we haven't really explored yet, there's kind of lots of ideas. Maybe we'll get built one day, maybe not. Um, and yeah, we're kind of looking for people to uh, give it a try. Um, will something come of it? I'm not sure. Hopefully it's useful for some people. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, so yeah, this is repo. It's all open source. Read the docs. Um, yeah, that's me. Thanks. Right. <coughs> oh, I see a hand for questions. Hi there. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for your talk. I just had a question. What's the, the, the good and the bad about debugging these kind of uh, test cases? Are, like, are they ugly? They get really ugly, and, and yeah, what happens? Uh, I think we've kept the tests reasonably simple thus far. Um, I don't know if, if Jeremy, my colleague, can maybe weigh in. So it's no better or worse than testing anything else with uh, complicated environment, environmental requirements. Um, Docker is pretty terrible and unreliable if you're trying to do a lot of things quickly. We mostly manage to work around that. There's occasionally a test that will just randomly fail because Docker decided that in Python 3.7, it's sometimes not going to give you all the logs. Um, but that's the case for pretty much anything of this complexity that we've tested. Yeah. 
I think for me it's been, I think, better than kind of these integration style tests I've done in the past without Docker. Um, Bruce. Yeah, just a quick comment, might be of interest to people. Um, you mentioned Docker Compose and it uh, only waits for things to start, not necessarily to actually be ready. Uh, the newest versions do actually support waiting for a health check to pass. So you can start the first container, yeah. wait for it to say pass an HTTP health check before it starts the next one. I found that useful in some testing. Cool. Thanks. <laughs> Um, I have one quick comment. I think Jamie didn't actually mention it. The driving force behind creating Seaworthy is that um, Jamie and I and the rest of the SRE team, we're getting really tired of explaining to people that their application isn't running because their code works, but their Docker file doesn't. Um, so this, uh, the, the selfish reason was to push the work to the developers instead of the operations <laughs> team. Um, the, the real reason is let's get this right the first time and not push bugs to production. Uh, yep. Hey, um, so, a simple question. It seems like this stuff is quite heavily integrated into how Docker like fundamentally works. If they make drastic changes, does that mean you guys have to follow suit to get those things working again? Uh, yes. Um. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, f I feel like Docker has kind of pretty much settled on an API. Like it hasn't drastically changed in quite a while, as far as I know. Um, like, and it'd be great to have like the Docker checkpoint stuff be stable, and then we could just like freeze processes between tests. Um, so, yeah. You mentioned earlier that the speed of the tests sometimes depends on the Docker daemon itself. Um, is it a good idea or is it horribly irresponsible to then say you've got um, say you've got a cluster and you've got a bunch of workers and they've all got um, Docker daemons running on them? Is it like ever possible to like farm it out <laughs> to those multiple Docker daemons or is that like actually a bad idea? Uh, technically, you can configure it to, so it just speaks to the, the default Docker uh, socket on the host. So you can configure it to connect to any Docker daemon that you would like. Um, it only supports connecting to one of them at a time <laughs> so far. But yeah, you could. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> any other questions? Um, we have, uh, an we're, we're about to run out of time. Uh, is there another question? Because we have some t-shirt yeah. giveaways for good questions. T-shirts. <laughs> no, I think we're good. Okay. okay. Um, can you just, uh, like, uh, who, what questions were good? Uh, the first question was pretty good. Um, uh, he asked about Docker moving along, which is a good question. Um, uh, Mary asked about the daemons. Um. <laughs> okay, um, can, you, can, you, can you three please come up to the front? Otherwise, thank you very much. Sure.